Hi everybody. So uh, I've seen you already for the automatic uh, pick picking and, and scoring, if you remember. Uh, I haven't seen you through all the course, and I'll still try to summarize a bit what you've seen. And I'll try to open up a little bit the discussion by the end of this class about uh, what you can do and what we now try now to uh, change a bit the terminology about uh, what is targeted proteomics and what is not targeted proteomics. Because there has been a lot of confusion in the field and even between groups like Brendan, I mean Mike McCoss and our group and other people in the world. Uh, it's sometimes hard to adjust terminology. So I will introduce you some papers that now start to kind of formalize a fixed terminology that we all speak about the same thing, okay? But, um, so I first um, uh, want to have kind of a, a rapid summary of what you've seen, I hope, during this week that was interesting for you and all the different steps that you need to, uh, we need to think about when you go back to your lab and when you, when you want to run your, your uh, targeted proteomic assay in your lab. So for this, I'm going to use the the, the chart that was used in the presenting the tutorial overview and this presents basically the different tutorial that you went through through the week and just to re uh, shape this a little bit different with really the different steps that you need to go through when you devise a targeted proteomic assay. So I think the first step, so when this is the typical case scenario, when you're in the lab, I want to target a certain protein, how do I proceed? So you have a, um, a customer, if you're in a facility or, or you want for your biological project, I want to target that protein, how shall I proceed? And basically the first question you have to come up because we measure in bottom-up proteomics peptides, which peptide sequence, which R shades, which fragments of that peptide shall I measure? Uh, shall I use pre-existing spectral library, endogenous spectral library, synthetic peptides, synthetic dirty, synthetic uh, aqueous, uh, synthetic aqua, synthetically labeled aqua peptides to generate assay. So this you have seen mostly basically in tutorial one and two. So if you go back to your lab and want to run this, just start, take again your tutorial, go through this, set up your skyline documents, think about how to generate a transition list. This is where you get basically the information from. Uh, I will also comment about the external resources and uh, for example, like, uh, papers, sorry, <laughs> published in the literature or like uh, external resources like Peptide Atlas or maybe Panorama or Chorus, uh, where basically you've seen, I think today, this afternoon, how to import this data kind of directly in Skyline in order for you to get started from data uh, acquired in external labs as well. And you can think as a, an, an extra resource in the worst case scenario, kind of in silico triptych digest based on, com on computational resources, and this you can do it already inside Skyline, but you just tell, I want this peptide with these fragments, and you use the filtering criteria of Skyline, it outputs you basically the theoretical fragmentation that you could, in principle, try to target for targeted proteomic experiments. So basically, with these tutorials, you have seen pretty much everything that you need to know in order to generate from a protein um, that you want to target, the list of peptides, the correct charge state and the proper fragments to target for your proteomic experiments. So this is your selection criteria. Next is basically how you build these libraries to get to this criteria. And this you have seen that you can, you can actually generate your libraries in order to get the best possible assay. It's again from a shotgun DDA experiments or SRM triggered MS2. I think you have seen this also in tutorial three when you actually basically imported SRM triggered MS2, MSMS spectra in order to generate a best possible assay for your, uh, for your, uh, for your peptides. So you can directly import, use the direct import functions of Skyline. Uh, Skyline also allows you to give prevalence of some library versus some other one. So if you have some in-house library that you have acquired on the same machine, you should always put it in Skyline higher up than the external library. This type of tricks, it will help you basically to refine also your assay on the fly. Uh, another important thing, so the, all this was at the moment presented based on Skyline, but if you're interested in or want to expand in more tricky situations, I recommend you to read this paper that we published last year 
Uh, it explains really all the details that you need to know about what's the similarity in fragmentation you should take care of, how to generate free consensus library. For here we use actually external tools and then from this really very highly refined spectral library then you can import that in Skyline in a Spectras format and there you can actually process your Skyline from there. So sometimes it's more convenient to use directly Skyline to generate the whole thing, but sometimes if you want really some specific for a specific research um, project, you can also work out the spectral library outside with external tools and then import the, pr uh, the very, very highly refined uh, spectral library into Skyline and work with that refined library. So then is the question how to make use of it as a list. So you have to remember in Skyline, usually the typical things, if you have a triple quadruple instrument, the first thing is to export this as a list in order to do the SR measurements. For DIA, it's a little bit of a different story because you actually acquire your DIA completely independent of the assay list and use the assay list just to trigger the extraction of your DIA data sets, right? But in both cases, it's the same story. Which fragment shall I consider? Jay commented shortly about the limitation of DIA, for example, that if you do a SILAC type of measurements, you don't want to use B ions. So always think really how to when for each typical type of experiments, labeling, non-labeling, size of windows, etc. What are the best fragments that you could actually use in order to do your measurements and to you do your assay? Similarity of fragmentation, retention time with IAT realignment, etc. And all this you have seen also in these tutorials. So go through these tutorials, uh, look for the answers when you reach that point in your in your workflow. Then the question is about the measurements. So I think here you haven't had really a tutorial on that, but you heard, and I, I think it's very, very important as an experimentalist that you're aware of the problem in statistics behind. So the talks of Olga Vitek that you have seen about sample randomizations, sample blocking when you do a, a type of experiment, this is very, very important because your statistic downstream will depend on that very strongly. So think about that when you start measuring your samples. Think about also like the um, uh, triple quadruples, typical instrumentation parameters is isolation windows, collision energy, scheduling. And this you have seen, I think, in the, uh, you have not seen, but I think you have the tutorial in hands where you can go through the different instrument uh, param uh, parameter optimization for targeted proteomic experiments in a triple quadruples. For DIA, you've heard, I think, from, uh, from Jake already some clues from Ben what's important things to consider like about the cycle time, the mass range, number of windows, windows widths, etc. So all these parameters are very important when you start to program your instruments in order to get the best you can out of the measurements and that you can get the best out of the samples, okay? Next step is how to identify. So you get the data out of the machines, you get back to Skyline. So you have a topic about visual inspection and you have a topic about automatic identification with scoring criteria for discovery rate and uh, assessment of the quality of the peak, basically, that you score. And the last step is about the quantification. And here again, this is maybe <coughs> something that was uh, covered mostly in the MSTATS tutorial about the normalization, the statistical test that you can do in order to, uh, to make best use of your um, uh, technical, biological replicates, grouping of samples, uh, um, control versus disease, etc. So all these are actually then also covered in the tutorial eight. So I think with this, you have seen pretty much the entire workflow from thinking about a protein and a peptide onto the quantification after the measurement. And you should have in hands basically with all these tutorials and all the things that you have seen this week, when you go back to your lab, the, the basically you can do real high quality targeted proteomics. I hope you can uh, uh, do that with all these tutorials. And I think this tutorial nine was na uh, newly put in place by Isabel and Ben. And, um, and that was the first time I think it was tried in this course. And I think it's the idea of tutorial nine was again to recapitulate and to summarize all the steps that you have seen in one single tutorial that you can again go back to this one and re-follow from step one to, st to last step all the different things that you have to do in Skyline in order to have your results from assay generation to quantification, okay? So I think the tutorial nine was something that was missing in the past and I think here you have really the complete workflow in one go from beginning to the end, okay? And as a last thing, I want to say, like, in, uh, in order to open your mind and open, expand your knowledge onto something else, now that you have done your quantification of your peptide of interest for your, for your 
favorite protein candidate, think about now how you can expand that. So for example, and this is what I'm going to speak about in the next couple of slides, especially I'm speaking about DIA because this is what now most people are actually moving into. You heard even like uh, Jake talk when he started with PRM and at the end he said we measure everything with DIA anyway now. And the thing is that with DIA you have the ability to remind your data. So once you have identified your protein of interest, you see it's changing, think about can I look for new peptides? Maybe the peptides that I have are not the best for quantifications. Maybe I have two peptides that go up but one peptide that go down. Can I try to extract a false peptide in order to validate which one is actually the correct trend? Can I search for PTM for that protein, etc.? So you can really use this ability and now in Skyline you can basically start again from scratch, do a second round of refinement, add new peptides, remove peptides that were not good with the quantifications, add new peptides with modifications and really re-extract your data in case of DIA or reacquire new data in case of SRM in order to get even more and deeper information about your protein candidate. But I think this is something that <coughs> was not completely covered by this tutorial, but I think this is for you only the starting points, the tools to get started, and only now you can really try to think how can I make best, uh, the best leverage of those tools in order to really expand my knowledge on my biology on my samples, okay? So this is just to give you an idea of how you can go even beyond those tutorials, just even to continue searching for interesting discoveries in your biological samples. So this was to give you a kind of a summary of all what you have seen in this, uh, in this week. I hope that you, we have covered all the questions or if you have any other questions about the different workflows, I think you had also the Geopardy and I think this was already covered. So this was just to kind of wrap it up like in a, in a, in a workflow manner. And in the next couple of slides, I will introduce you this concept I told you about what is retargeted proteomics. I think these slides, this couple of slides, Ben already showed you most of them. Uh, these are slides I prepare for review that's going to be published in June. And I'm going to explain from these data structures from SRM, DIA and DIA and DDA, how you can basically extract the data or query the data in different manners. Okay? So about the data structure itself, you have already seen those slides, but basically to recapitulate, uh, usually most of the mass, uh, mass spec measurements start with an MS1 scan, and here you see the MS1 scans acquired at different retention times, and here, so in this dimension here, they have different retention time, and the spectra are acquired one after the other one in this sequential order, okay? And for example, at this retention time here, you had most of um, a gray peptide coming out, a little bit of blue, and then the next one, the blue one was actually taking over, etc. And then you see, and now if you think, and you have been using now this week, the, on, the entire week, kind of a chromatographic visualization of this type of data, and now it's very nice and I hope easy for you now to visualize this data in the time dimension and not anymore in the mass dimension. So in the past, most people, and because of the legacy of most of the old mass spec instruments, everything is still spectrum based. So you see the spectrum of one after the other one and you need to use the arrow key to move from one spectra to the other spectra. And now most of the data, actually visualization and analysis that we do is doing it on the, chromatogramming, on, the, on the chromatographic space. So now we are changing really from one dimension to the other dimensions in order to sync this data and to sync what we can do with this data, right? So this is MS1 and this is the basis on which Shotgun is based. And what Shotgun does, it takes the most abundant species it finds at every spectra or the top 20 most abundant species it finds at every spectra and then it's selecting it with a certain isolation window. And here the idea of this box is basically to give you an idea about the isolation width of the mass spectra on that specific precursor. And you see that at that scan here, it selected the gray precursor and you get one single snapshot recording of that MSMS spectra of that specific peptide. Okay, next scan here, it selected the gray one was on the exclusion window of the shotgun method and then it selected the blue one with an arrow, it's usually between one and three uh, uh, Dalton isolation window, and selected this spectra. And, as you, and then here the red one, this spectra, the gray one, this spectra. And already from these very simple pictures, you can think about problems, right? You see here this blue spectra, which is actually coming from very, very high intense, it's the highest intense peptide in my picture. It's actually one of the most contaminated spectra. 
And the reason for that is that, by chance, is actually colluding within one Dalton with the gray peptide here. And as you can see here, all the gray fragments here, you're lucky I colored them in gray, but the mass spec is agnostic again, what is gray, what is blue. Basically, these are signals. And actually, you see, because actually at that time point, and this is by default in the, in the shotgun mode, you actually trigger the detection, the, you trigger the acquisition of the MSMS spectra at a rather low threshold. And therefore, actually, at that time point here, the blue signals of that blue peptide was actually lower than the gray contamination that you had in that window. And therefore, actually, the, the um, the component of the of the gray fragments are actually even sometimes higher than the components of your blue fragmentations. So this is just to, to already hint into something that we're going to speak about specificity and about isolation widths, how much is like shorter windows uh, helping you to improve your specificity, bigger windows actually detrimental for your specificity, and actually where you can find the best sweet spots in between. So the major take, mes take home message about shotgun is basically that each of these MS spectra is a, a snapshot of a different peptide. So shotgun was designed to have each MS MS spectra basically a different thing. In principle, you can do an exclusion window, and in the best instruments, most people actually take it once and exclude it for the rest of the peak in order to have the machine the fastest possible, in order to get as many IDs as possible. Right? So it's super fast, you get a very high number of identifications. It's instrument driven, you have no power, what the machine decides when it decides to take the peak and everything. It's, and it's very strongly biased towards the highest abundant species. And of course, maybe in this run here, the, the gray sample got selected, but maybe in the, next, in the next injection, the gray sample was slightly shifted to the right. And then in this case here, the, it was colluding with the blue, and then it was not even selected for fragmentation. So the thing is that it's not consistent across sample, and that's the major bottleneck about uh, uh, DDA, so untargeted mass spectrometry acquisition, because in this case, you actually get this, as Jake called them, unholy matrices. Oh, no, sorry, holy matrices, where you actually have a lot of missing values, which are due to this uh, instrument uh, uh, non-consistency between uh, sample for MSMS identification. And one of the most important points here I want to comment is that this MSMS spectra are continuous in the mass dimensions, but they are discontinuous in the time dimension. Okay? So here they have the complete recording of the MSMS spectra in mass, but they are all completely disconnected from each other in the time space. Okay? On the opposite, um, uh, SRM is actually very different, or SRM or PRM, I will show you also in the same slide. Basically, here you're only interested in the, blue, in the blue and in the red. The gray, you don't care. So what you're going to do, you're going to do two separate recordings of the series one for the blue and series two for the red. And what you do, you do sequential acquisition of windows, and you see that it's wrapping between one and the other channels. And what you acquire is the blue, exclusively the machine is forced to take the fragmentation on the blue uh, peptide or on the red peptide. And as you can see here now, the recordings are now uh, continuous in time, but now they are discontinuous in mass. So you see here, you don't have the full recording of the MSMS spectra. You just have recording of one dietalization Q1, one dietalization Q3. Everything in between is basically blank space. Okay? So you don't know what's in between. The only thing that you concentrate about is that this precursor gives you this fragment, this fragment, this fragment, this fragment, this fragment and that's all. Okay? And you do this for the blue, you do this for the red, and there you get this type of analysis where you actually, in Skyline, you don't look at them at all in the mass dimensions, you look everything in the time dimensions, and there you get this type of coelutions of fragment uh, ion spectra signals. So here you cannot say they are fragment ions, these are actually fragment signals which are captured in that window, whether the signal is clean, or whether the signal is contaminated by chance by another signal, this you will see this interference, you don't know. So it's your recording actually uh, coelution of fragment ion signals of that precursors. Okay? And um, as a so just to 
summarized. Now each MSMS series is a recording of one peptide across the tight dimensions. The fragment ions are acquired over and over and over, and they are used actually to record, to reconstitute the elution profiles in the chromatographic dimensions. You have a consistent and accurate quantifications. It's very consistent because bec between different samples, you're always forcing, it's a user-driven acquisition, so the machine is forced to select always and always the same thing. And unfortunately, the big drawback of that method is that you have a very limited number of precursors you can monitor per run. So this is true for SRAM, this is true for PRM. So I put out uh, another picture and just to compare the data structure of SRAM and PRM. Here you see in PRM you have exactly the same uh, acquisition uh, window width of Q1. So usually it's smaller than shotgun, so I told you shotgun is between 1 and 3 Dalton. SRM is between 0, 0.7 and 1 Dalton. So this blue window is actually smaller than what you had before. And the thing is that um, now the PRM, the big difference between PRM and SRM is that you see here, while here you had only four different channels that you could record because you were only measuring four transitions, and these channels were discontinued between each other, now in PRM you're measuring full MSMS scan at every single time point. Okay? So you're measuring now fragmentation of that window, but you're measuring it not only for four fragments, you're measuring it for the entire full high resolution, high mass accuracy, MSMS spectra on the Arbitra or on the TOF instrument, okay? So you get a picture which looks a little bit the same, but which you can realize already now it's much more complete already in terms of information. So now you don't have only discontinuous information, but now you have continuous information in mass as well, okay? And then if you're not happy with these transitions, even in PRM, it will be even more true in the IA, you can actually kick out this one that you did not like because it was contaminated. So you kick out these transitions from Skyline, and then you pick up another one in Skyline from your PRM, and this is something that you could already not do in SRM, okay? So this is already a little bit the difference between PRM and SRM. PRM allows you basically already a little bit to refine your data, but only for that precursor. So again, PRM will only focus on blue and red. So the gray and gray you will miss, okay? So you will record everything you want in the MS2 dimensions, but only for blue and red, okay? So the rest of the method will be blind for what is the rest in your sample, okay? So that's the big difference. So PRM is, is uh, in a sense, more data rich than SRM, because you actually record full MSMS spectra. But in terms of precursors, it has the same limitations. You can also not cover more than 100 precursors per, per MSMS, per injection, okay? And the last method, which is basically combining the, what they call now, what Jay called like comprehensive proteomics, is basically a method that can acquire MSMS of everything all the time in a cycle time that allows you to reconstitute the fragmentation chromatographic profile in the MSMS dimension. So this is DIA or SWAS, and here I showed you, for example, these four precursors. I showed them on purpose to be, say, to be actually uh, between mass 500 and 525, and I say this because this was the original SWAS isolation window setups that we use in the original paper. Now we actually use much smaller window already now, but this is just as an example. Now what you do, you acquire now for this MS1 space, you acquire one MS2 space for that specific space. So if you have now 32 windows, you will, you will actually acquire 32 different MS2 space pictures like this, one after the other one. And these MS2 space pictures are acquired in such a way that now the window you see is this big uh, red box. You see now you don't do any more selection of a very narrow window, you have now a selection of a super large window which co-fragments everything which is coming in that mass range. So everything in that mass range is sent to Q1, is fragmenting, is give you that fragment spectra. Okay? And you can see, for example, in the worst case here when, the bl uh, when for example, the gray and the blue uh, co-elute together in the precursor MS1 space, you see that their fragments also co-elute in the MS2 space, okay? So this is the SWAS MS2 picture acquired at 500, 525, and if you have 32 window, you have 32 SWAS MS2 space like this, one after the other one, and then you query those different space, one after the, o one after the other one, depending on the peptides. And the big advantage about this is that the MSMS signals are continuous in time and in mass, and they are recorded for all detectable precursors. 
And as you can see now, you can think, because this data contains, it's such a data rich, you can actually think of analyzing it in every possible dimension. So what people, as I will show you in the next couple of slides, people have tried to analyze it in a spectrum dimension. So for example, you can pick this spectrum here. This is this picture above here. You can take this picture here, and you can, you can try to identify what's underneath. Or what you can do, you can also use what you did in Skyline, use the chromatographic dimensions, and then you can try to identify, is my peptide here? Is my peptide here? How many um, contaminations or interference do I have in my signals, etc.? So this data is such that you can actually analyze it in the mass or in the time dimension as you like. So in comparison, <coughs> So this is to summarize. It's a multiplex recording of all peptides, uh, recordable peptides across LC. The instrument is forced to fragment everything all the time. You have a consistent acquisition for, of the MSMS spectra across samples, because between samples now, it's the same uh, fragmentation window that you also acquire across samples. And you have the same reproducible quantification capabilities as SRM, because you're basically forcing as a user, you're forcing the extraction of certain types of analytes in your samples. Now, this is again to have everything side by side. As you can see here, only DIA allows you to analyze the data in the mass and the time dimensions. Shotgun can only allow you to analyze the data in the mass dimensions. SRM only allows you to analyze the data in the time dimensions. And SWAS or DIA can basically allow you anything you, can, you want to do. And you can think about the data in completely different dimensions. It's everything is possible now because you have all the data in all dimensions. Okay? So this was just, I think you have seen these slides with Ben as well. This was just to resummarize these data structures because now it has a big implication about what we can do with the data. And I will um, finish this part with explaining you why now we are trying also to refine a little bit between our groups, between the different research groups, what's targeted proteomics, what's non-targeted proteomics. So for this next couple of examples, I'm going, just going to show you the different, um, it's only DIA, and I will show you already on DIA, people have tried basically almost everything possible. So the very first original MS2 searching that was tried was this Pacific, the original DIA paper by Yates Group and the XDIA by Yates Group were basically taking single spectra one after the other one, and then they were just sending them for searching against the database, okay? And this was working to some extent, so when the peptide was at the highest possible intensity of the, of the peptide, then the fragmentation was the best possible, and then they could already identify a lot of different peptides in this targeted, in this, sorry, in this database uh, search engine, uh, classical search engine that they used, was used Sequest at that time. So the next generation of, um, of search was basically using a demultiplex MS2 searching. So there, for this type of all these groups and all these softwares, what they have developed was kind of a pre-cleaning of the data. So they were still actually doing the search in a spectrum, I will come back to this terminology, in a spectrum-centric manner. So they were still outputting spectrum out of the data, but to output those spectra, they were actually cleaning them up by highly refining the coelution traces of the fragments. So for example, here, they say like here, I have these three fragments, gray fragments that coelute nicely together. I group them and this is only one species, okay? Here, I have a nice one that coelutes together and this is another spectra. This one coelutes, this is a nice spectra. This one coelutes, it's a nice spectra. And then we're doing the same things, database searching, target decoy database searching, and then they were identifying already a lot more than in the former analysis just because the, same, the spectra were highly refined and highly demultiplexed, okay? But again, this strategy was, again, everything based on spectrum, dimension, search against a, ta a target and a decoy database with a classical search engines, okay? Then uh, another generation uh, of uh, strategies, searching strategies were coming up, and these were called these peptide-centric query strategies. So I'm going to re-explain you again exactly what I mean by spectrum-centric. But here the idea is that you start from an hypothesis, you have a certain peptide, and your question is, is my peptide present in my data? So in this case, for example, for this group that published uh, almost at the same time as our SWAS paper, what they started from, they started from a spectral library. So here they use a spectral library, 
and then they interrogate at every single spectra of the DIA, is this spectra has a chance to be present there. So what they do, they take the spectrum, and then they try to find a match. At every single spectrum, they try to see whether there is a match in the mass dimension, okay? And once they find a match, they basically get a score. As you can see here, there was hardly no match, very bad score, a little bit better match, a little bit higher score, higher, higher, higher scores, and then the scores were basically vanishing down, okay? And then what they could do, they could plot kind of a, a chromatographic elutions of the dot product scores of the match, and there they could say in the highest evidence that the peptide is present is at this location, okay? They were still using a spectrum-based uh, scoring dimensions, but they were already interrogating the, the peptides' presence inside the data, okay? And um, the last uh, one that is the one that you did, and that's the one that we called SWAS, and that's the one that now people call peptide-centric, and this is the one that you can do in Skyline. You also start from a reference spectrum library, but here actually you don't query the spectrum in the spectrum dimensions. What you do from the spectrum, you actually select the most intense uh, peaks of that spectrum, let's say the top four, the top six, or whatever, and for these different uh, mass of fragments, you're going to extract physically the data that you have, okay? This is what you did when you did your SWAS MS extractions, and then now you get basically a picture, not anymore in the mass dimensions, but a picture in the time dimensions. And this is what you open in Skyline, you get these pictures of coelutions, and there you can see, okay, here I have my peaks, here I have an interference which comes from the coelutions of that fragments here from the gray, here I have a an interference that comes from the coelutions of that red fragments here in the MSMS fragmentation space, but still I can recognize my peak and I'm happy that this is my own notifications, okay? So these sets of tools, and this was the first time that we actually were using really like identification on a peptide-centric, so you were interrogating hypotheses and you were scoring identified peptides in the chromatographic dimension, okay? So that was just to place a little bit all the different strategies around, and for this you use, you did it also by yourself in the tutorials, use the same scoring, exactly the same, coelution, peak shapes, relative intensity as you do in SRM, and you have many, many more because you remember, compared to SRM, in the IA, like in PRM, you have the complete MSMS spectra recordings at every single time point, so you can say this is the highest evidence of presence of my peak, so you can get the MSMS spectra at that point, whether it's demultiplex or not demultiplex, but at least you can actually check and you can validate here that the peaks are monoisotopic fragments, the peaks have the right charge shades, the peak have the right uh, mass accuracy, etc. So you adjust basically double almost the number of scores that you can have compared to SRM. So this is just to wrap up also a little bit how the data dimensionality also you can actually interrogate and query it in very different dimensions, in very different manners, and get different type of scoring depending on the dimensions you're using, and getting very different types of metrics of results. <coughs> and the comments I had about this different terminology was actually really uh, nicely emphasized, and this is a paper that I really encourage you to read if you're interested in this story. It's this paper by the MacCos group, and they actually asked many other professors in the field to give their okay on the terminology that we already all start kind of to converge against for the same terminology. And the idea is that now we try to call this approach a peptide-centric query strategy. And the idea is that, I will show you in the next couple of slides, is that now you can separate basically the data acquisition from the data querying, okay? The data acquisition, you do it in shotgun, you do it in SRM, you do it in DIA, but the data query is completely independent and the way you interrogate your data is completely independent of what the machine does. And I think they already started very nicely in, their, in that paper to summarize and to think about different ideas. So for example, what they describe, so they put back to back what uh, the first original strategy is that 90% of the proteomic world used in the past was the spectrum-centric query strategy, where you start as a query unit, the data, the MSMS spectrum, and then the idea is that, uh, coming from shotgun, is that each spectrum uh, means there is one peptide inside, okay? And then you take that spectrum and you try to identify what's underneath that spectrum, okay? And therefore, you use a, ta a target decoy database, search engines like all those one listed, and then the scoring is based on the best possible candidate that retrieves a database 
sequence for that specific spectrum. So it's this spectrum, the peptide spectrum matches, and this is everything is spectrum centric. Okay, so you start from the data, you take one spectrum from your data, you look in your database if you have something. If you have something, you say, okay, I could identify my spectrum. So it's this peptide underneath that spectrum. Okay, but it's spectrum based. You start from the spectrum to look in your database. Okay. So this is typically what they do in DDA. And as I explained to you what they do in DIA, the they take the spectrum, refine or not refine, they interrogate the sequence database, and then they get the best possible identification under that spectrum. Now the big thing came when we started to have all these new ideas about interrogating the data, and this is where now things start to diverge. So now here in these peptide-centric strategies, what you have as a query unit is not anymore the data itself, it's a hypothesis. So your hypothesis is, is my peptide present in my data? So you start from a question. As a biologist, you want to know, is my peptide present in that data? This nobody never did in shotgun in the past, basically. Y here you start from, is my peptide present in my data? So the idea is that each peptide should elute only at one possible place on my chromatograms and for a short period of time. And then the goal of this is actually to find evidence in the spectrum dimensions or in the chromatogram dimensions for the presence of that peptide. So I showed you here, for example, that people have tried that by looking in the spectrum dimension. This was this uh, F uh, FTRM. They even tried sometimes to do it on DDA, of course, here, because it was a very sparse and, as I told you, completely disconnected in the time dimensions. You had one single evidence of presence of your peptide across the entire run, so you had to decide if you had to trust this or not. But now with DIA, if you have this AT FTARM, or if you, lose now the, if you use now the SWAS type of uh, extraction of fragments, then you have actually collusion of different fragments as evidence of your peptides. But now the idea is that you restart from uh, questions. Is this peptide present in my data? You interrogate your data, and then you get a certain score. And then this score is a proof of evidence of that peptide in your data. OK? It's, you, Read this paper, you will see it's very subtle, but the difference is fundamental and it has big implications in terms of statistics that you have to use in order to validate these hits, in order of, uh, like when you start to search like large number of species or interrogate large database, if you want to reinterrogate your data sets with new questions like is my peptide present with a PTM, etc. So it's a very different uh, strategy in terms of point of view. And now only people start a little bit to separate and try to really understand what's the difference between the different strategies, okay? And as, just as a, as a joke, I wanted to show you this. It's, uh, uh, I don't know if it will work. It's kind of, uh, I'm a fan of CSI, so I want to show you kind of the type of CSI type of database searching that people do. They start from a fingerprint. The question is, who touched my computer in the last five days? And then you get your fingerprint, you get your match, and the question is, you get your match from your database, OK? And the question is, this is typically what we call spectrum-centric query. You have a question, so you have a, uh, um, a fingerprint, and then you go to a huge database which contains all possible uh, individuals in your lab, and then you interrogate from this database who is the most likely guy to have touched my computer, OK? So this is the typical thing when you have actually false, false, false. And at some point here, you have some spectrum that stands up, and they say that's the mostly likely hit of that specific fingerprint, okay? And as a comparison, that you understand the peptide-centric as a completely the opposite way. So here you don't start from the data, you start actually from the list of people. And then you take the most likely people that were on your computer this week, you say, was this guy touched my computer? You say, no, it's not him. Did this guy touch my computer? Yeah, yes, it's him. So you can see here, just in terms of the, direct, uh, the directionality of the question is very different. In one case, you started from the data, you interrogated a set of people. In this case, you start from the people and you interrogate your data, right? And this is as a joke, but just that you can also s uh, memorize a little bit what's peptide and what's spectrum centric and how much actually you actually start from different directions when you actually cross completely the type of hypothesis that you query your data. <laughs> And um, 
So this is a table that I also pulled up for the same review where you have these 3D pictures. And I think they did not touch that on, on the Mac OS paper. And I think if you now use this strategy of querying, and then if you compile it together with a data acquisition scheme, you can basically recapitulate all methods that have ever been established in, in, in proteomics. So the most simple one is DDA, shotgun. And as you can see here, the most classical way was the spectrum-centric searching of this data. Database searching, spectral library, de novo. You have people that also do this uh, AMT. This was Rick Smith's lab, Dick Smith's lab, when they did this AMT, accurate mass and time, where they rest rely on the coordinates in the MS1 space, but it was still MS1 spectrum based. And then, uh, and then you have the match between runs. And then you have this peptide centric that I commented to you about salsa, where people tried as a single hit by chance to find the peptide identifications. Then you have the SRM type of data, where actually the spectrum centric is only applicable in PRM because you cannot do it in SRM that doesn't have the spectrum dimensionality. And so most of the targeted data acquisition is mostly limited to peak scoring in the chromatographic dimensions. And then you have the data independent acquisition where you can do both. I showed you examples where people interrogated the MSMS uh, spectra in the MSMS dimension using the raw MS2 searching or the demultiplex MS2 searching, and where people now use now petite centric querying strategies like FTRM or SWAS targeted chromatographic extractions. So this kind of basically summarizes all existing acquisition uh, data acquisition of the machine and all ex existing data querying strategies that have been developed so far in proteomics. And this is just again a summary in a little bit less joking way than the fingerprints. Here you have your spectrum, you interrogate, so you get all the possible sequence from your target decoy database that match this mass of precursor plus minus 10 ppm. You get this section of peptide, each of them gets scores, and you get the best possible identifications here on top of your spectrum. So you start from the spectrum, and then you look in your database what's the most, quer most probable query that you have. So the number of decoys, again, as I told you in the identification parts, stays constant regardless of the number of spectra that you search. While if you do a targeting query strategy, especially using the chromatographic base, you have your peptide, you have your decoys that corresponds to the mirror match of your peptides. This sequence of fragments should exist in nature. This sequence of fragments doesn't exist in nature. Therefore, here you basically get an impression of the noise. You have the highest scoring peak in that chromatography. It's eight. The best scoring peak here has a score of one. Here you actually see where they sit between each other, best scoring target, best scoring decoys, and here you can actually tell them apart from each other. Correct for multiple, uh, correct, correct for multiple testing hypotheses, this is very important. And this is what we call now targeted, uh, well, what we used to call targeted extraction of the data, and now that we try to rename uh, peptide-centric querying of the DIA data, okay? And this is also a picture that you saw in a different form also from Jake's uh, presentation, is this type of uh, typical shotgun matrix that people used to acquire in the past, where you have a tens of conditions and thousands and thousands of, of proteins. It could be like ten thousands of proteins, but this matrix contains a lot of missing values. And you cannot really expand very much in the number of conditions without increasing even further the number of missing values. The targeted acquisition SRM is kind of the completely opposite dimensionality. You have many samples, like hundreds of samples in the cohorts, but you can only monitor hundreds of peptides. And therefore, you have a metric which is very, very full, so almost no missing values, and it's very consistent across conditions. And the DIA with this peptide-centric uh, data querying is basically allowing you to have the same number of throughput in numbers of conditions and codes and you have an SRM. And also with the depths, almost, not quite, because we are not as sensitive as shotgun, but you have also a much larger depth than what you have in SRM with a very restricted number of missing values that you have in your matrix. So I hope with this it kind of summarizes a little bit all what you have seen in this week and it puts it in perspective about also the biology that you can have behind these different data matrices that you get out of your proteomic experiment, okay? So just a few words to finish. So again, some words about the terminology. So now when we speak about targeted proteomics, the targeted, we try now to refer to the data acquisition scheme of the instrumentation. 
So what is targeted is SRM PRM because you actually only pre-select from your, you remember your MS1 space with these four peptides, you only from this space select two peptides, okay? So you force the machine and you target exclusively these two peptides from your MS1 space, okay? So you force, the machine it is targeted in the acquisition manner, okay? DDA is untargeted, the machine is let free to decide and it's let free to pick up everything it can. DIA is now what uh, Jake named like comprehensive proteomics. You acquire MSMS spectra of everything all the time, okay? So here you don't have any, it's, it's not targeted in a, it's targeted in a sense that the machine is forced to take always these big windows, but it's not targeted on a specific peptide, it's targeted on a mass range. And the fact that it's targeted on a very broad mass range and you cover the complete mass range of precursors, we call that comprehensive because in principle you do not miss any peptide colluting in those windows. The um, terminology about the data query is now called spectrum-centric spe spectrum and peptide-centric. And the spectrum-centric refers to people that start from the data and from the data trigger searching against the database, while the people that call peptide-centric start from a querying hypothesis, is my peptide present in my data, and is looking for that peptide inside the data, okay? And now again, as I showed you again with the data dimension 80s, the idea is that you can think now, you can even do peptide-centric in a spectrum dimension, or peptide-centric in a chromatogram dimensions, it will impact on the scorings that you can do, it impacts on the decoys that you need to generate, but basically you can cross now the different dimension 18, the different query mode that you want to do. And in terms of for you, what take-home message you want to take is which best methods shall I choose for my sample? And uh, my advice is that, as Jake also say, if you know your absolute favorite candidates and if you need absolute sensitivity and absolute uh, specificity, you should still consider SRM and PRM because these are the one because you focus your instrument so much on a specific narrow mass window for the fragmentations, this will still be the instrumentation and the methodology that will give you the ultimate sensitivity and specificity. There is no doubt about that. I mean, I'm, I'm developing this DIA here, but if you want absolute sensitivity and selectivity, you should consider SRM and PRM as uh, the ultimate method for your, for your type of analysis, okay? And now, as Jake said, if you don't have the money or the chance or enough samples maybe to have the chance that a biologist comes back tomorrow and tells you, oh, it's nice you find this protein, but I would like to know if this protein also in my sample. And then you say, but I don't have sample anymore, or I don't have instrument time anymore. You should consider using this comprehensive proteomics or DI experiments because with Skyline, with these peptide-centric querying strategies, as long as it's detectable, you can actually basically cover everything. So the best possible compromise you can do at the moment is do a DIA, see everything you can see, and then for the special candidates that you're really, really absolutely interested about, for those 100 leftovers that you could not detect in DIA, do an SRM, okay? But you can really get the best of both worlds. First, when the biologist comes to you, is asking you, is this protein, protein, protein inside my data? Do a DIA, see what is your level of sensitivity, how many do you already see by DIA? And the one that you don't see that he, the biologist really wants to see, reacquire the data in SRM targeting specifically these proteins, okay? And if you have some more kind of discovery projects, DI is anyway probably the way to go because it's the optimal settings that do not miss anything, okay? So the extra values, again, to emphasize of DI versus SRM is that you do not need to worry about the SRM uh, data acquisition assay list in advance. You can, again, on the fly, uh, remove contaminated transitions, so, um, if you have uh, uh, interferences, you can refine your identification, you can refine your quantification in Skyline, you can uncheck the different fragments that look bad to you, you can add new ones. So DIA allows you this type of reiterative analysis and you can also ask additional questions. So this happens now very often when you see that your two peptides go up, one peptide goes down. So the question is if I interrogate a fourth peptide of that protein, is it going to obey with the two first ones or with the third one? is the one that disappeared, what happened to it? 
Was it miscleaved? Was it modified? You can search for the modification of that peptide. So there are basically unlimited things you can do with DIA data. Your data is there. The peptide, if it's disappeared from its normal form, it must reappear somewhere else. There is no magic. And usually you find always the reason why that peptide disappeared. And this is always very reassuring to say, like, it did not disappear from nowhere. It actually came up with a miscleavage. And then you say, OK, maybe I should not use it for SRM if it's miscleaving half of my samples, right? So this type of thing you can also really inter interrogate and investigate when you do DIA. And as Jake uh, hinted a little bit, I think in the future, this is, DIA, this is in, in DIA mode that the machine improvement will have the biggest impact. So I showed you these uh, isolation boxes in shotgun and SRM. And you know this one Dalton uh, of isolation in SRM, one Dalton, one Dalton, is basically the, the isolation uh, uh, width wall that can do a quadrupole. So the quadrupole cannot isolate thinner bands than one Dalton without losing too much sensitivity. So when people have already interference in SRM and PRM, this is clear that this will always stay the same. But in DIA, you can think now, OK, we have 25 Dalton windows. Now, actually, with the machines, we acquire like 10 Dalton windows. In five years, I'm sure we'll acquire DIA with one Dalton windows. So every single mass will be actually acquired for MSMS spectra all the time. So there will be basically no need for shotgun. There will be no need for SRM. Everything will be basically acquired in one single shot at one single time. And then the only thing that will differ between the different people will be the way you will look into the data. Some people will still do a spectrum-centric. Some people will do a, a peptide-centric using the chromatographic dimensions, spectrum dimensions. But at the end, the data will always be complete. And then it will be up to the people to interrogate the data in the correct way to get the best they can out of the data. So this was just to give you kind of a, an overview about the different instrumentation that we have and maybe what the future can look like uh, in a couple of years when the machine will be fast enough to achieve that. So with this, I will close the course. I thank all the speakers that participated. And of course, you as participants, I hope you enjoyed the week and that you learned a lot for taking back home. And um, yeah, thanks for coming in Zurich. And, uh, all the best for you.